Hello and welcome to my channel. Antarctica, the southernmost continent, is home to some of the most mysterious and unexplained phenomena on Earth, from unexplained disappearances to strange creatures and unexplained geological formations. There's always something new and exciting to uncover in Antarctica. Join me as I embark on a journey to unravel the mysteries of this frozen continent and reveal its secrets. Whether you're a history buff, a science enthusiast, or just someone who loves a good mystery, you're in for a wild ride. So sit back, relax, and get ready to discover the mystery of Antarctica. Antarctica is the only continent which isn't a country, doesn't have a government, nor any indigenous tribals living there for ages. One of the most obvious reasons is that it is the coldest continent in the world. The temperature can go as low as minus 89 degrees Celsius. Additionally, it is also the windiest place on Earth, with snowstorms at a speed of 300 kilometers per hour. It can blind you. Antarctica is also the world's driest continent, to the extent that you might be surprised to know that it is considered a desert. There's only around 51 millimeters of rain here, and even when it rains, it turns into snow before reaching the ground. So in a way, Antarctica is the only place on Earth with little to no human influence, but it doesn't mean that countries all across the world haven't tried to take over Antarctica. France claims some part of Antarctica, Norway claims some part, and Australia lays its claim to the entire continent on the right side. Countries like Britain, Chile, Argentina, and New Zealand claim various spots of Antarctica. So is Antarctica truly divided among these countries? In today's video, let's get to know the interesting geopolitics and history of Antarctica, a composite portrait of a continent that has challenged man since he first sailed beyond the limits of his horizon. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by frozen seas. The south, the bottom of the world, is considerably colder than the top of the world. Missions to study the weird wonders of the Antarctic are only one piece of the greater puzzle that confronts man at every corner of the universe. The Song of Antarctica's Secrets is only one piece. Let's begin our story right at the beginning. Around 350 BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle was among the first to say that the Earth was spherical. At the time, the Greeks were aware of the Arctic regions in the north. They had named it the Arctis. The word Arctis was derived from the bear. The constellations that we can see in the sky, one of them being the Great Bear, were inspired by the constellation, and they named the Arctic region Arctis because they knew that the Earth is spherical. They knew that the north and south are like mirror images and would have similar features. So they named the unknown southern region Antarctus. It meant antithetical to the bear, the opposite of Octus, and from here, the name Antarctic was derived. Humans stepped on Antarctica for the first time during the 1890s, but hundreds of years before that, Antarctica had started appearing on maps. When several explorers went on expeditions around the world, they knew that if they went to the south of the world, they would come upon some land, but they didn't know exactly what was on the land, or how big it is. This is why, when the French explorers made the world map in 1530, they drew Antarctica. The northern hemisphere is depicted on the left side, and the southern hemisphere on the right side. The largest landmass in the middle of the southern hemisphere was named it literally meant unknown southern land. About 200 years later, in 1773, British naval officer James Cook became the first person to go to the south of the Antarctic Circle. He was about 130 kilometers farther from Antarctica when he turned his ship around. Even though he hadn't seen Antarctica, he had seen icebergs with rock deposits on them. When he saw those rocks, he concluded that Terra Australis does exist, but going much closer to Antarctica was so dangerous that he had famously said, he was so sure that no one could reach Antarctica, because the place was so perilous, with strong winds blowing and the ship in danger of hitting icebergs at any moment. But his words were proven wrong 50 years later. It is quite controversial as to who was the first person to step on Antarctica, because several people claim to have been the first. The British-American Captain John Davis believed that he was the first person to do so because his ship was lost and he reached Antarctica. The first and disputed landing was in 1895, when a Norwegian ship called the Antarctic reached its shores, got into a small boat, and went on to the land. A Norwegian in the boat was Karsten Borg Grooving, claims that he landed before the boat and he was the first to step on Antarctica. But a man from New Zealand, Alexander, claims to have been on this boat, and to keep the boat steady. He was the first one to step out of the boat. These two people from the same boat got into an argument about who was the first to get off and the first to step on Antarctica. After this, the first 20 years of the 1900s are known as the heroic years of Antarctica. Because many expeditions were conducted during this time, there were many scientific discoveries, and we learned many new things about Antarctica. It was the first time we found out that there are plants growing on this continent. Mosses were found growing in Antarctica. After this heroic era came the colonial period in Antarctica, when several countries tried to lay claim to Antarctica. Between 1908 and 1942, Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom. Apart from them, there were countries like the USA, the Soviet Union, Japan, Sweden, Belgium, 
and Germany that were conducting explorations and new expeditions on Antarctica without claiming any territory. During Hitler's rule, in 1939, a German Antarctic expedition was carried out, in which they flew in an airplane to take pictures of some areas of the Antarctic. They even dropped metal Nazi swastikas, claiming that the areas where the swastikas were dropped were under the control of Nazi Germany. Surprisingly, during this period, the USA wasn't very active. In 1924, the Secretary of State in America announced their official position regarding the territorial claims on Antarctica. He said that if any country discovers new land in Antarctica, it doesn't mean that the new areas would belong to that country. The land would belong to the country only when there are actual settlements in the area, when the citizens of that country live there permanently. After the end of World War II, these countries started fighting each other over their claims on Antarctica's land. By fighting, I do not mean literal warfare. What I mean is that they were expressing their claims more strongly. These countries have set up permanent research centers in Antarctica to show that they have a permanent station in the area. And since researchers were living there permanently, they claimed the land as their own. If you look at the map of Antarctica, there are several islands near Antarctica. The Heard and McCary Islands, on which Australia established stations in 1947-48. In 1953, France set up bases on the Kerguelen and Croge Islands. The next year, in 1954, Australia reached mainland Antarctica and set up the Mawson Station. It was on Antarctica's continent. One year later, Argentina set up the General Belgrano Station, which was in Antarctica on the Filkner on ice shelf. There's so much ice in Antarctica that it's difficult to know if there is land under all that ice. In this map, you can see there are some ice shelves on the exterior of the land, and these ice shelves have different names. Setting up research stations had become a political strategy for the countries. At one point, the British, Chilean, and Argentinian bases were so close to each other that it was clearly evident that they weren't set up solely for scientific research. It was clearly evident that these stations were being set up for intelligence activities. In fact, the territorial claims of these countries on Antarctica overlap. Look at this political map of Antarctica. The blue dots are the present-day bases of the various countries. The existing research stations in Antarctica. The Antarctic land claimed by Norway, Australia, France, and New Zealand can be clearly demarcated. Their territories do not overlap with each other. But if you look at the left side of the map, you'll see the land claimed by Chile, Britain, and Argentina overlap with each other. Chile's claims include the British and Argentinian claims as well. In 1950, the Soviet Union government issued a memorandum to the rest of the world, saying that if a country claimed Antarctica's territory without the Soviet Union's permission or if it made decisions regarding Antarctica with the Soviet Union's participation, the Soviets would not recognize any such claims. By this time, the Cold War had broken out between America and Russia, and people were afraid that the two countries would start their geopolitics in Antarctica as well. These countries were already fighting each other in multiple areas of the world, but no one wanted them to be fighting in Antarctica too. But thankfully, it didn't happen. In 1958, American President Eisenhower issued a notice to the rest of the governments, calling for a treaty to ensure that Antarctica would always be a free and peaceful place. In Washington on October 15, 1959, a conference was held on it. On December 1, 1959, the Antarctic Treaty was signed. There were three major points in this treaty. First, Antarctica would be used for peaceful purposes only. Second, everyone would be free to carry out scientific investigations. And third, the results of the scientific observations would be freely exchanged and available to all. Initially, this treaty was signed by 12 governments, including all countries that were claiming territory in Antarctica. But the most interesting thing about this treaty is that the claims of these countries weren't abolished. This treaty merely suspended those claims temporarily. So legally, even now, these countries can continue to claim those territories, and they are indeed doing so. This political map of Antarctica is still valid. Australia claims the largest share. Australia claims 42% of Antarctica. But it is also important to notice that America rejects the claims of these countries. Not only America, most of the countries around the world reject these territorial claims. Not only this, these seven countries claiming territory in Antarctica do not recognize each other's claims. France, Australia, New Zealand, and Norway recognize each other's claims, but the UK, Chile, and Argentina do not recognize each other's claims because their territories overlap. Today, the countries that claim land in Antarctica merely have a symbolic claim. This treaty temporarily suspended the claims, but it also means that on the expiration of the treaty, these territorial claims would become important. This is why these seven countries have held on to their claims over Antarctica. This treaty is set to expire in 2048. Post that, whether this treaty would be renewed or not, will have to be seen. Let's talk about why countries may not want to renew it later in the video. But thankfully, with the help of the treaty, in the present there has been little to no geopolitics in Antarctica. 
and more scientific research. This has greatly benefited scientists. The International Council of Scientific Unions established a special committee to conduct research on the Antarctic, under which scientists from different countries are coordinating together. This is why, every year, about 4,500 scientists go to Antarctica to work, and a strong collaboration between scientists from different countries has been seen. Friends, it is interesting to know about India's role in this story. Actually, in the beginning, India was completely against this Antarctic Treaty, because India believed that this Antarctic Treaty would be used by these 10 to 12 countries to capture Antarctica. Even though the countries agree that the land will be used for peaceful purposes only, it is possible that these countries may choose to carry out mining. If oil is found there, these countries would mine for oil and make profits out of it. India had appealed to the United Nations that the United Nations should take over the control of the entire continent. But the UN didn't do this. No country can do drilling and mining in Antarctica, so that Antarctica is protected. It was very important to do so, because many countries are scavengers when it comes to oil. Under the guise of exploration of oil, a large number of places have been destroyed. In a study from 1992, the U.S. Geological Survey experts found mineral explorers in Russia claim that there are 500 billion barrels of oil and gas under Antarctica. But there are two reasons why till now oil mining hasn't been conducted in Antarctica. The Madrid Protocol is the first reason the treaty that keeps us protected from such instances. And the other reason is that it will be quite expensive to do so, at least for now. But in the future, due to climate change, the threat may increase further. As this ice is melting due to climate change, it is becoming easier to access Antarctica. New technologies will be developed with time and perhaps then it wouldn't be an expensive affair, and it becomes economically viable to extract oil and gas from there. As I told you, this treaty will expire in 2048. If these countries do not renew this treaty, this can be possible after that. Several countries have taken to fishing in the oceans near Antarctica and exploiting it, like China. China has recently expanded fishing and tourism there. Actually, after the year 2000, China is the only country that has set up research stations in Antarctica. No other country has set up new stations. Apart from this, according to the data from 2018, there were several private yachts carrying wealthy individuals that went to mainland Antarctica and illegally exploited nature there. Several countries talk about the ocean around Antarctica coming under a new treaty to regulate things so that there is no overfishing there, and to ensure that no one enters the oceans illegally and that it becomes a protected area as well. After 2003, there is a permanent physical presence of the Antarctic Treaty as well. The headquarters are in Buenos Aires, Argentina. If you look at this in the sense of geopolitics, today, Antarctica is not a country. It is a political territory where several countries have come together to collaborate and have divided power among them equally. But Antarctica doesn't have any police force, no army, and no legal system. The loopholes in this treaty can be seen being exploited even now. For tourism, tourists can go to the British station in Antarctica named Port La Croix and get their passports stamped there. Even in the territories of Chile and Argentina, tourists can get their passports stamped. It is another way in which these countries express their claims. Countries collaborating together are not allowed to do mining and drilling, but people can be allowed to go there for scientific research or tourism. Or should we explore Antarctica even more? Comment below to let me know. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if this video was interesting to you, you will be interested in my other videos. Go check out my channel. If you like this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more videos like this. Let's meet in the next video. Thank you.